Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Hub Chat Health. I'm Renee, your host, and today we are answering some of the big questions, those big health-related questions that you've sent in. Yes, we are discussing diabetes, heart disease, and cancer. Did you know that one of the leading causes of death worldwide is heart disease? And did you know that diabetes can be reversed? We are going to talk with an expert who has treated many clients and has seen firsthand how you can not only manage, but also reverse these lifestyle diseases. It's great to welcome our very special guest to Hub Chat Health today, Walt Cross. Welcome to Hub Chat Health, Walt. Thank you, ma'am. Glad to be here. It is lovely to have you. Walt, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes, ma'am. I'm from the Appalachia in Southeast United States. I worked in healthcare for 20 years and then left that about 22 years ago. I uh, went to a clinic that we specialized in reversing diabetes, reversing cardiovascular disease and dealing with cancer. And then uh, left that and came back home to East Tennessee, back in the mountains. And this is where I work with people today. So you're working with people with these lifestyle diseases and um, they come to you, is, is that right? Or do you go to them? Both. Uh, just had a lady just before I came in here that had come in. She just found out this week that she has uh, colon cancer that has metastasized to the lungs and to the brain and to the spine. Yeah, that sounds very serious. So you said that you worked in the healthcare, the uh, conventional healthcare system for yes, quite a number of years. So then what, why did you make the change from that into what you're doing now? I saw that we were masking and managing, that we were not uh, reversing. And um, it was a money machine. And um, I saw that there was places that reversing diabetes, reversing cardiovascular disease, reversing many other types of diseases. And I went into healthcare to help people not an issue just to be a revenue stream. Right. Absolutely. But rather being a real help to people. Yes. With their lifestyle diseases. Yeah. Because, you know, we have some great nurses and doctors and they do amazing jobs in our yeah. conventional healthcare system. And now I'm assuming you're not against conventional medicine. You're saying that there's a time and a place for that, but you're looking at simple remedy simple ways of healing yourself is that correct it is correct you know if i'm i'm also a fire chief and so i work a lot of trauma situations uh, and an interstate runs the right through my fire district and so i work a lot of really bad wrecks on the interstate and we need that trauma care i fly patients out routinely to university of tennessee's trauma center to to uh, johnson city trauma center that we, you know, a charcoal poultice is not going to fix a compound femur, fracture of a femur. And so we need that, that trauma care that is, and let me put it this way, a friend of mine who was at that time a professor at Loma Linda Medical School, he said, well, the majority of what we do on the floor at the hospital at Loma Linda can be done in lifestyle. That's on the floor. But what we see in trauma, that's a different situation that's acute, that we need to be uh, many times more aggressive. You've got to have surgery. You've got to have different interventions, and there's a need for that. The problem of what happens on the floor with chronic diseases, that's where we get into masking and managing, and I found that lifestyle medicine is more aggressive and more effective. Absolutely, and I guess I know firsthand exactly what you're talking about because my son managed to break his left arm a few weeks ago, a couple of months ago now, and then two weeks later broke his left leg. Oh, um, no. I know it was it was a, a terrible time, but it, you know he needed surgery, and um, he had to it had to be pinned, and, and there was quite extensive surgery that happened. So I do understand that there is a time and a place, and that's not what we're talking about today. No. We're talking about lifestyle diseases aren't we? And, and this is where uh, people often think that it's a pill, or it's an injection that you need to, to fix those lifestyle diseases. But we're going to go and we're going to have a discussion today about ways that you 
at home can implement things in your life to change your, um, to, to reverse the sicknesses. So, well, I just want to say again, thanks for coming on Hub Chat Health. Um, before we get into our discussion, why don't we start with a prayer and just ask God for his presence. Father God, I just want to thank you that we can connect across the ocean, across the other side of the world, and we can talk and discuss ways of um, healing ourselves through the natural remedies that you have given us. God, we know that lifestyle diseases are wreaking havoc in our world today. But thank you that you have given us ways that we can heal ourselves. And God, as Walt talks about these uh, and explains these, we just ask that our hearts and minds can be opened. We ask this now in your name. Amen. Amen. So, Walt, let's start with some of the big questions here that we have. <clears throat> Diabetes. Diabetes is a very, very common disease. Can you explain what is diabetes and can diabetes really be reversed? Well, let me answer your, your second question first, and that is yes. We see over a 98% reversal rate of type 2 diabetes. In my first 20 years of healthcare, I saw zero. Not one in 20 years. Now it's very common. It's to me, it's easier to, to get rid of type two diabetes than it is to fix nail fungus in your toe. Um, and so let's look at the root cause. And I think root cause is important. Um, an example, I was just talking with a person that has lung cancer and I said, you've got to stop smoking. And, 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 and and the example is I use with her, let's say you have an arm and I'm rubbing sandpaper on my arm and you come and say, oh, honey, let me put some medicine on there. And you put medicine on there. And then I then go to rubbing it again. And then you put more medicine on there. And then I go to rubbing it with sandpaper. Is it going to heal? Not till I finish, not till I quit rubbing it with sandpaper. And that's the way it is with chronic diseases many times. And so as that person's got to stop smoking, the person with type 2 diabetes has to stop what's the root cause. Now, I found three major root causes of type 2 diabetes. Um, and, and so what you have, if you have trillions of cells, and around each cell has an insulin receptor. And the insulin opens a door and allows the glucose from the blood into the cell, and, and everybody's fine. The problem happens is when the door doesn't open right. And we then have something called insulin resistance. And there's three things I found that causes that door not to open well. The first is if the, if the door, if the cell gets too big, the door doesn't open good. Have you ever in the wintertime gone to open a door and it's kind of sticks on you because of the weather? Same thing. And so what's the cause? The door has gotten too big. The door, so, I mean, the cell has gotten too big, so the door doesn't open. All you do, you have to shrink the cell and then the door starts opening. It's that simple. So you go back to ideal body weight. The second thing that causes it is too much fat. Now, I don't know what it's like over in New Zealand. The only thing I know about y'all, y'all have Manuka honey, which is really good for wound care. <laughs> it's expensive, we do. It's expensive it is but it expensive. works well. It does. Yes, but indeed. where I'm from in the South, we fry everything, maters, taters, ice cream, pickles, cheese, um, chickens, pigs, okra, uh, Twinkies, uh, um, Oreos. If we can fry it, we fry it. And then if we don't fry it, we pour oil into it. My grandmother would take green beans and she would pour over a cup of vegetable oil in that pot of green beans. Well, it tasted good, but it was deadly. I mean, it looked like an oil slick on top of them green beans. Uh, then also we do a lot of dairy in the South here. I, I was raised on a dairy farm. And so we, we eat a lot of cheese. We eat a lot of, of, um, of ice cream and butter, a lot of butter, uh, a lot of milk. And then the next problem is we eat a lot of meat. And, I, and I was, when we quit dairying, we went to beef cattle. So I was in a long time in beef cattle. 
And so we eat a lot of meat. Where I'm from, we eat a lot of bear. And bear's got a lot of fat in it. Actually, right now is bear season. It just opened yesterday through this coming weekend. Now, I say we. Not me anymore. Never did eat bear. But um, I don't eat the, the, the dairy anymore. I don't eat the meat anymore. And the frying I don't do anymore because it's unhealthy. But what happens is, is that oil that's either in the deep frying or the, uh, or the fat that's in the deep, deep frying, the fat in the oil, the fat in the dairy, the fat in the meat, what that does is it clogs the insulin receptor. Now, you said there, Walt, that meat and dairy is not good for you. Now, New Zealand is huge in dairy. It's, it's dairy and sheep and beef is what we do here in New Zealand. We eat a lot of that that um, type of food. Why why are you saying that it's not very good for you? What does it do to your body? In this case, it clogs the insulin receptor. And so the insulin receptor gets clogged and it doesn't work well and it causes insulin resistance, which causes diabetes. Outside of that, and we'll come back to the diabetes, but... This was very difficult. When I went to and took nutrition from Cornell University, you've heard of Cornell. Um, if you watch the, uh, the movie Forks Over Knives, mm -hmm. Dr. Campbell was our principal instructor, professor. And I learned something very shocking at Cornell that really bothered me. Again, my family was in dairying. We learned at Cornell that dairy is the most significant chemical carcinogen ever discovered and that's quoting straight out of the out of the, out of the textbook diseases of affluence then we learned that dairy incre increases the risk of type 1 diabetes by 1100 percent wow that's, that's huge enormous. that is huge that's very huge mm. and and so that's just one part of dairy that that's the challenge we also see the issue of raising cholesterol well, I mean, that that's really that is huge that you say it, it's um, it has such a huge effect on our body, um, and it's this obviously not commonly known because if it was, we wouldn't be eating it, would we? No, but that's not where the money is. Mm, yeah, very um, true. And, and so when I quit eating meat at sixteen, but when I was in my late thirties, my 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 cholesterol was 288 and the guys that were, I still work in regular healthcare and the guys at work said, well, you've got to quit using, uh, you've got to go on a statin. Well, I didn't want a statin. I knew the problem with statins. I worked in healthcare. And so I decided to go on a no added cholesterol diet. And so I thought, well, what do we do for, um, you know, for hypertension, we'd go on a no added salt diet. So I'll go on an added, no added cholesterol diet. When I went on a no added cholesterol diet, my cholesterol went from, 288 to 104. Wow. Now, how do you know what has cholesterol in it? It's real simple. If it has a mama, if it has a mother. That's a nice principle. That's a nice thing to um, sort of uh, rule it all by, isn't it? Yes. So let's like, let's look at my favorite sandwich. Y'all like tomato sandwiches over there? Do indeed. Okay. We call them mater sandwiches here. <laughs> so does, does bread have a mother? No. No, so there's no cholesterol in the bread. We'll come back to the bread, but there's no cholesterol in bread. Does mayonnaise have a mama? Um, it depends what the mayonnaise is made out of. Yes. And so if it's Hellman's, Kraft, it's got eggs, eggs have a mama. Mm -hmm. Therefore, mm -hmm. eggs have cholesterol. Yep. Does a tomato have a mama? Nope. Nope. Does the lettuce have a mama? Nope. Does the cheese have a mama? Uh, yes, it does. You'll see. That's right. Uh, how about the piece of bacon? Uh, yes, it the does. Piggy. That's right. And how about the pickle? I uh, know. So no. it's real simple. If it has a mama, it has cholesterol. Mm -hmm. And so I quit eating cholesterol. All I had to cut out was the cheese, or the, the dairy, the cheese, the milk, that kind of thing. So when and I cut out. That's a big thing, Walt, because cheese, I know firsthand, cheese for me was a big issue to try oh, and stop. Now, I've been vegetarian for many, many years, but when I switched to plant-based, 
It was another shift. And cheese was the big thing because it was so highly addictive. Mm -hmm. And and I liked it and I wanted to do it and I wanted to eat it. And it made me feel good, well, for a short time. And then it gave me a headache and, and a few other things as yes. well. But I found that cheese was a real challenging one to give up. I tell you, when, when Mary Lou and I got married, I graduated from school. And I said, now, when we make enough money, I want you to buy at least six kinds of cheese and put them in the refrigerator. I want several kinds of crackers. So when I get home, I can have cheese and crackers before supper. And then in the evening, if I want cheese and crackers, I can have more cheese and crackers. I yep. loved cheese. Uh, mm -hmm. It was the hardest thing for me to, to change in moving to a, a healthy lifestyle. And whether it was because I was raised up on a dairy farm and we had a lot of it, I don't know. But dairy is a significant challenge. Um, <clears throat> so as you look at, um, at why is dairy bad? Why is um, meat bad? Um, yes, in diabetes, it causes the insulin receptor not to work. But the second qu the item that you were talking about is cardiovascular disease. And a mm. big issue there is cholesterol. It's your triglycerides. And, and so those lipids. And so as we eat that type of meat, dairy and meat, we increase that in the body. Not to mention the diseases that are in it uh, that we're more prone to. People who are, are total vegetarians, they have a lower white count. It's because they're not fighting the pathogens that are in the dairy and the meat. Like the regular, you know, the normal labs for white count is, is here, but in your total vegetarians are down here. But it's normal because they're, they're not fighting the pathogens, you know, the diseases that are in, in the meat and the dairy thing. So the, the second thing is, the, is the, um, the fat that clogs up the insulin receptor. Well, here's where God's really good. God is so forgiven, just as he forgives you when you're sinning, God forgives you when you make wrong health habits. And so what happens is, is as you quit eating the fats, the body then goes and cleans those receptors out. It's like, yeah. have you ever seen folks <clears throat> haul a concrete mixer behind their pickup truck to, to, to make concrete? Yep. Well, at the end of the day, do they use concrete to wash it out? No, they don't. No, they use water. Yep. Well, we wash out this insulin receptor by quit eating fats. Mm -hmm. And we even quit eating avocados and olives during this time. So that's all fat. Well, no. Good well, some, and even good fats, some foods still have fats in it. But yeah. our food like avocados and olives, which are good fats, they're just real high in fats on the good mm -hmm. side. So you want to clean that out and going fat free will do that. So it means you're not eating any oil or they y'all say oil there. Oil. <clears throat> yes. We say oil here. Um, and then, um, so that cleans it out. The third thing that causes it where that insulin receptor doesn't open right. And that is, um, uh, inflammation. Inflammation will clog this, this little door. Harvard says, Harvard university says the number one cause of inflammation in the United States is processed foods mm. when you go into a grocery store at least here in america if it's in the middle part it's probably processed okay. absolutely look, same except, here except the freezer, you know the freezer section but yes. around the side you've got the produce mm -hmm. and so the processed food is is huge according to harvard university in causing inflammation another major cause of inflammation is sleep deprivation Hmm. Huge. Uh, see, sleep deprivation increases C-reactive protein, CRP, which is going to increase inflammation. I and would so, say though, that, well, most people are sleep deprived. Most people don't oh, have enough sleep. Absolutely. And there's three major components of sleep. <clears throat> Number one is we used to think we just needed six hours sleep. And then we found, no, we need seven hours. Now they're telling us no seven and a half. And actually Harvard is now flirting with, no, we need eight hours of sleep a night. The Breezel Belloc study, which you're familiar with, the Alameda County study in California, uh, found that we needed eight hours of sleep, uh, somewhere between eight and nine hours. People live longer. But that's one that would, mean, that would mean we need to go to bed at around sort of nine, nine thirty at night. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. Actually, Harvard says nine. Now, this is cool. This is really interesting. When I was in school and took healthcare, we learned, you know what the lymphatic system is. 
everywhere in the body except the brain. Mm -hmm. And so as we looked at the, at the charts, the brain did not have a lymphatic system. But guess what? It does. We found this out around 2013. It's called the glymphatic system. And Harvard found that the glymphatic system turns on around, you know, the lymphatic system cleans out waste. Well, the lymphatic, the, the lymphatic system cleans out waste. Well, the brain's lymphatic system, which is the glymphatic system, kicks on at around nine o'clock at night. From nine to 10, it does a deep cleaning of the brain. From Only if you're asleep, I'm assuming. We're getting there. <laughs> from because, I mean, because it, it wouldn't yeah. be able to do a deep clean if you're watching tv or if you're exactly. on a device or something would it? Right. and so from 10 o'clock to midnight it does a thorough clean and flushing the brain but you're right you got to be asleep yeah and so okay. so that's number two so you yeah. need the eight hours of sleep you need yeah. those hours before midnight which now we know that the hours before midnight is worth twice the hours after midnight of sleep but there's a third component with sleep that's very important. Again, we're trying to keep inflammation down for diabetes on this situation. And that is contiguous sleep. We need that REM sleep. Let's say you've got fellows out there who are listening and they have prostate problems and they're getting that five, six, seven times a night. They're not getting into REM sleep. You got a lady who wakes up and she's worrying about the kids. You got a lady who wakes up and she's worrying about the grandkids. You know what that's like as moms and grandmas or whatever. And so you can't go back to sleep or maybe you do and then you wake back up. Well, you're not getting into REM sleep and REM sleep is very, very important for, to, for not having sleep deprivation. So you need the eight hours of sleep. You need to be asleep by nine o'clock at least. And then you need that contiguous sleep. So mm -hmm. that will help with the inflammation. So we have processed foods, we have sleep deprivation, stress, will cause inflammation, dehydration. There's a number of things. So if you get rid of those three things, shrink the cell to ideal body weight. If you get rid of the fat, and if you get rid of sleep deprivation, you reverse type two diabetes. It, that, that almost sounds too simple. It does, doesn't it? it? It sounds too simple that we don't know. Common, you know, this isn't out everywhere that we should be knowing that lose weight, get back to ideal body weight, get rid of all the fat in your body, in your diet, all the uh, processed food and all the unnatural fats. And even sometimes if we're starting with uh, diabetes, we need to also reduce the natural fat as well for a while. You, you were saying there, things like avocado and oils and things like that, and get good sleep. That just sounds too simple. I yeah. love it. It's amazing. You know, it reminds me of um, God's given us eight healthy principles to live by hasn't he yeah and, and this is just and that's three of them and that's three of the eight healthy principles yes amazing you know for those who don't know about the eight healthy principles i'll pop them up here on the screen let me just go through to where they are there we go there's the eight healthy principles so if you haven't seen this before the acronym is new start and there they are. There's now Walt's talked about three of those. You'd be looking at nutrition. You'd be looking at, well, exercise if you want to try and reduce your weight. And you'd be looking at getting some really good sleep. But you also talked about dehydration, drinking lots of water. Mm -hmm. So that is amazing. So, Walt, what else? If we were then to look at heart disease, heart disease is the biggest killer in the world. Um, definitely within our Western countries. I looked at the statistics here in New Zealand and in America. I was looking at those statistics. That it is by far the leading cause of death. What can we do with heart disease? If we've got heart disease or if it's common in our family, if it runs in our family, what can we do to try and reduce the risk of getting heart disease? Again, you've got to get to the cause. <clears throat> when I go to Africa, and I go to a country called Rwanda. The people in Kigali, which is 3 million people, that's the capital city, they have heart disease. They have diabetes. But when I go out into the bush, they don't have it. And they've mm -hmm. got stress out there, but they don't have it. Uh, back in 2000, I was working with uh, uh, Indonesia. And the major cities, I asked, what is the disease? It's syndrome X. Uh, you know, your diabetes, your heart disease, your obesity, and those kind of things. 
And I, and I said, what is your diseases out in rural Indonesia? <clears throat> and they said it is um, uh, infections. I said, what do the people in the cities there in your, your major cities, what do they eat? A, the first one was Wendy's, but then it was Pizza Hut. It was McDonald's. It was Burger King. It was the American fast food. Mm. I said, what do your people in the bush of Indonesia eat? <clears throat> they said rice, um, uh, vegetables, fruit, and some meat, some meat. And I said, what was your diseases in your major cities before American fast food came. Guess what they said? Infection. Wow. What were they eating in those major cities before American fast food came? Rice, vegetables, mm. fruit, some meat. And so <clears throat> we call it the diseases of affluence. So as a country like New Zealand is affluent. Mm. And so as we have more money, we start eating different. <clears throat> When yeah, I was because you can afford yeah. it and you can afford to go and buy all that rubbish food that's exactly. in that main section of the supermarket, isn't it? Because it makes us, it's the quick fix to make you feel good for that 20 minutes while you're eating it. Yes. In 1969, I was born and raised here in East Tennessee. In 1969, Tennessee was the fourth healthiest state in the United States, which is hard to believe. In 2009, we were the fourth unhealthiest state in the United States. That's because Tennessee went from a very poor state to more affluence. Mm. In 1969, if I went out to eat, and they found there's several, four major causes. Number one is what we ate. And they found in 1968, if I went out to eat, it was to grandma's house. Mm -hmm. It was to grandma's house. <laughs> That's it. We didn't have the money to go out to restaurants. We're, we, you know, we didn't have much money up on the mountains. That would have been an exciting outing to go to grandma's house. Yes, that was going out to eat. In 2009, East Tennesseans, they were going to those fast food places. Number two, it's what we drank in 1969 versus what we were drinking. In 1969, we drank water. Um, if we did drink a soft drink, it was just a little eight-ounce soft drink. Yep. In 2009, people were drinking gulps. They were. Mm -hmm. I was talking to a guy not long ago and about his health issues, and I said, you know, how much water do you do? Water. Mm. He says, I don't do water. <clears throat> I said, what do you drink? He said, I do Mountain Dew. Do y'all drink? Do y'all have Mountain Dew out there? Yeah, we do. Well, Mountain Dew was developed just down the road from me in Knoxville, Tennessee. Mountains, Dew, the Dew off. So it's Mountain Dew. And he says, I was, he said, I said, well, how much Mountain Dew do you do? He says, three liters a day. Wow. Yes. And so that was a major change from 1969 from poor folks in the mountains to Affluent, more affluent in 2009. Number three was exercise. <clears throat> in 1969, I was in school. We had recess in the morning. We had recess after dinner. We had recess in the afternoon. Dinner in the South, we called the noon meal. And uh, and then you know, then when we got home, we had chores. We played. We rode our bicycle. I walked to school. I rode my bicycle. If I was good, I rode my bicycle. If I wasn't good, I, I walked to school. Um, we didn't have school buses. In 2009, kids were, you know, playing video games and, and that kind of thing. <clears throat> Schools were not going out and having the kids do exercise. We've gone to a very sedentary lifestyle, <laughs> haven't we, where everything is inside. You learn inside. You play inside now. I mean, you, you might um, go to the gym. It's inside. <laughs> Um, children, well, children really don't get off their bottoms. A lot of the time they're sitting in front of the devices or front of the TV when they get home. And, and part of that is because neighbourhoods have become unsafe, so they don't want to send their children out to play anywhere. Whereas, like you're saying, 1969, even when I was growing up, was a little bit later, um, we were out playing. That's all we did was play all day. Right. But life has moved. It's shifted and changed. Mm. So can you reverse heart disease? Yes. Okay. It depends what, what, on uh -huh. it depends on the severity. Okay. It depends on <clears throat> how much damage you have. Right. But yes, heart disease can be reversed. So let's have a look at so 
Um, some of the causes of heart disease is what we eat yes. and drink. So it's nutrition. If we would go back to, I'll just put this graph, uh, this up here again. So it's nutrition. <clears throat> um, it's lack of exercise. The heart's a muscle. It, yeah, it is. It is a muscle. You'll have atrophy. Right. So it's what we're drinking or or we're not drinking the water and we're, put it, we're drinking other uh, substances. You know, people say to me, uh, yeah, no, I don't like the taste of water, but it's okay because I drink six coffee a, a day. Um, you know, uh, we, we often don't get out into the sunlight. Like you said, we're inside a lot. So vitamin, our, D, I, vitamin yeah. D deficiency does affect cardiac function. Right. <clears throat> Right. And I would assume um, this one here, rest. Now, you talked about it in diabetes, but I would assume that it also affects heart disease as well. So what can I do to help myself if it's common in our family or if I have heart disease? Number one is you want to <clears throat> you want to look at the food that you're eating. Cornell University, Cambridge University found the most healthy food for heart disease was a whole food plant-based diet with variety. Now, Oreos are plant-based. Mm, yeah. um, um, Fruit Loops are plant-based, but they're not whole food. No. It's processed sugars, which isn't good for us. Processed flours, you know, that, that refined flours. And mm. so, you want it whole food. Whole food means just not processed, just like what you'd eat out of your garden in the backyard. So a whole food, plant-based diet, but it needs to have variety because we're not like dogs. We don't eat same old, same old. You want to have a variety of foods to have a variety of different nutrients. And people say, if I became a, a vegetarian, I wouldn't have much variety. Well, I can tell you when I left a diet that was dairy and meat, to a total vegetarian diet, my variety is much bigger today. I agree, completely agree. Once yeah. you start eating um, plant-based, the variety is absolutely enormous. You know, I work with children as an educator, and most kids don't know what a lot of the vegetables are and fruit out there. So as one of the things we would do, we would introduce healthy options and we would have lots of different fruits and vegetables that they could try a lot of the very simple basic ones that you would think well everyone knows what that is a lot of the kids either have never tasted or think they don't like it but it's amazing that once they have it at school they go oh it's not that bad and then right. the parents say oh they start eating it now so yeah i agree the variety is enormous so what else is there what else can i do so nutrition is huge if we put healthy food in, we're putting healthy fuel in. Exercise. If we're working the body, we're, we're working those muscles like the heart muscle. And that's very important. Uh, just like we've got to work our leg muscles or we'll have atrophy and we won't be able to walk as well. If we don't exercise the heart muscle with cardiovascular exercise, we're, the heart's not going to work as well. Water. Water is the train car that carries the nutrients throughout the whole body. And every function in the body, according to Dr. Batman Jotty, water has a part in. And so if you're dehydrated, you don't have train cars to carry that nutrients to the heart, especially to your distal, your, your, your hands, your feet, part of the body. Sunlight. Fact, absolutely. If you're thirsty, you're already dehydrated. That's exactly so, right. So it's good to be drinking constantly throughout the day, except and not that, with your meals. You know, and what you said is very important. There's a, a, a fella, he, you all know who Einstein was. So Einstein, he, um, he had a buddy of his who was a, a, um, a, um, another physicist. And he, he found that when we drink more than three to four ounces of water at a given time, it goes into free flow. So let's say I have this bottle right here. It's a, it's a liter bottle. I'm sorry. It's a half liter. And, and so let's say that I, I pour a liter in there. What's going to happen? It's going, it's going to overflow. So what happens is, is if we drink more than three to four ounces at a given time, it just goes to urine. We urinate it off. Mm. And so you want to have saturation. It's like going to your tomato plant and pouring a five gallon bucket on it. It's going to run off. So it's important just to take a sip of water, 
three to four times every half hour and you have better saturation. Oh, I like that. That's a good tip. That is a really good tip. You know, Walt, most people, when they think of a plant-based whole food diet, they think of rabbit food and they think of carrot sticks and lettuce. I mean, let's be honest, that's what most people say to me when I say I'm plant-based. So let's talk real. What sorts of changes can I make to my diet? You know, we live in a fast-paced world where it's always quick, get out the door, I've got to go to work early in the morning, um, get on the road. What sort of changes can I really make? Where do I start? You know, you start by adding some good stuff. Um, and, you know, some people just totally just change everything. That's not reasonable and attainable for everybody. Uh, some people don't do water. And I say, well, at least just start with one bottle of water a day. And then you can keep adding. For breakfast, start by eating a banana. Stick on some pineapple. Uh, put some mango. Uh, you can put some grapes. You know, as you add food to the plate that is healthy food, you don't have as much room on the plate for the other stuff. Hmm. And so start looking at a variety of fruits, a variety of grains that are healthy grains um, and add those, you know, for breakfast, uh, hmm. nuts, walnuts, almonds, almonds are the king of the nuts, hmm. um, seeds, you know, so just add a little at a time and, and, or maybe start with doing smoothies. Everybody likes smoothies. No, that, that really is the key, isn't it? Try something different. Yes. Don't make massive radical steps. And we're not encouraging, look, throw the baby out with the bathwater here. You know, because sometimes we think, oh, you know, I've got to uh, do everything that is here in New Start and I've got to implement everything within one day. No, I don't think that's what we're saying. We're saying, Try and put some things in that are different every day and take some things out that you shouldn't be doing because we right. all know what we shouldn't be doing. You know, you talked also, Walt, about um, the cause. Try and find what the cause is. And I'm just going to flip back to this here. This quote here, and I'm sure many of our viewers have seen this quote here, that disease is an effort of nature to free the system from conditions that result from the violation of the laws of health. Now, we've just looked at those laws of health. Um, in the case of sickness, number one, the cause should be ascertained, and you've talked about this. You've talked about, well, the, the fact of we've actually got to find what the problem is because how can we fix ourselves when we don't know the problem? And then we've got to correct the wrong habits and then nature needs to be assisted. Now, that's a beautiful quote and it comes from the Ministry of Healing, page 127. When we do and promote our, and talk about our health lectures and our health courses, we call it the four R's to health. So we recognize what's wrong, we ascertain the cause, we remove that wrong condition, we replace it with some the bad habits with good habits and that's what we're talking about and then we help to repair and assist nature and I'm sure that you're very familiar with this um, as well Walt yes. can you talk anything further to this that's the challenge that we had in regular health care is we did not get to the cause mm -hmm. um, because the co if you remove the cause then you don't have the revenue stream coming in and and so we mask and manage and so as we we get to the cause and let me share something important here Number one, ascertain the cause. Let's go back to what we talked at the beginning. I do not throw away the baby with the bathwater. When we are having some health issues, and you, I had a lady one time call me. She was from South Carolina, and she says, my husband's bleeding from the rectum. What do I do? I said, I don't know. I don't know if he has ulcerative colitis. I don't know if he has internal hemorrhoid. I don't know if he has a torn polyp. I don't know if he has cancer. I can't look in his colon. And so you need to go get someone, you know, a gastroenterologist to go inside and do a colonoscopy or at least a, sig a sigmoidoscopy, find out what the bleeding's from. Once we know what it is, then we can fix it. And so going to the doctor and, and saying, you know, can you tell me what's wrong with me? And he writes a prescription. Well, you can argue with him if you want to. I don't do drugs or what. Don't cause a fit. Just go on home, take that prescription, do whatever you want to with it. But now you've got the diagnosis. You paid him 
to diagnose it because he has the equipment, the lab, the whatever, or the expertise of looking. Now you've got that diagnosis. You ascertain the cause or the, what's wrong. Now you got to figure out the cause. Is hmm. the cause because, you know, this lady who was just here with lung cancer, what do you think the cause was? She was a smoker. Hmm. She's got to, you know, she's got to stop smoking. And I told her, I can't help you if you don't stop smoking. I had a guy come in one time and he'd been to the VA. He had a wound on his foot. Not really a bad wound. I enjoy working on wounds. And then his wound wasn't, it wasn't even any bigger than the tip of my finger. It was small and it wasn't healing. And so um, I, I, I called a buddy of mine. I, we used to work together. He used to work for me. He's a surgeon. And I told him, I, he does a lot of wound care. And I said, this, this wound is not healing. And he says, what are you doing? So I told him, he goes, is this guy smoking? And I said, oh, you're right. He smokes. He goes, it ain't going to heal. I said, you're right. It's not because we have vasal constriction. We don't have adequate perfusion through those capillaries in that area that we need to heal with, with the nutrients. Wound healing, you've got to have good nutrition. And now we just cut that flow off. We're not having good water. We're not having good oxygen because that goes through the blood. And so you, you identified the diagnosis. Now you got to figure out what the cause is. Take the cause away. And I told this guy, you got to quit smoking. I can't help you. And, and he goes, I'm not going to quit smoking. I said, I can't help you then. Mm -hmm. Obviously I tried and, and I missed that you were smoking. It, it won't work. You got to get to the right root cause. Mm. So let's talk about cancer. Now, I'm sure we all know someone who's been affected by cancer or a family member or a friend. Cancer has affected my family. What, what is cancer and, and why is it so common? I think, I think stress is a huge component in, in cancer. I think what we eat is a big compo component in cancer. Um, I think the affluent lifestyle is a big part of it. I was doing some research just the other day and the affluent countries have significantly more cancer than non-affluent countries. And what's the difference? I think a big difference is yes, they, I'm sure they have stress, but do they have the level of financial stress and whatever the more affluent person is, the more stressed they are. They're worried about losing their money. They're worried about how to spend their money. Um, and so I, I believe it's it's what we're eating. It, it's those eight laws of health. And where's stress following those eight laws of health? Trust in God. Um, and so if we will follow those eight laws that you gave, then 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 it significantly lowers our risk of getting cancer. When I took nutrition at Cornell University, Cornell will tell you very quickly, nutrition is a significant cause of cancer, or the poor nutrition, the, Latin, the wrong foods, the processed foods, uh, the, the dairy, the meats are a huge cause of cancer. Yeah, you know, you've reminded us that, yes, the eight laws are very important, but that first one there that says nutrition, it seems to be one of the pivotal ones, you know, the real foundational ones, that what we put in is what we're going to get out. You know, it's, we put more stuff in, we're going to, it's going to manifest in some way. It's the fuel for the body. Yeah. Let's say that you, you got um, the, the best Bugatti. Now, Bugatti is a car. Yes, and is. the best Bugatti is over $18 million. It's probably over nine. It was like 18.9 million. It's probably over. I'm sure it's over 19 million now. Uh, the gold edition of the Rolls Royce is 18.4 million. I'm sorry, $8.4 million. Do you think that driver is going to be particular on the fuel that he puts in that Bugatti or in that Rolls Royce? Absolutely particular. Is he going to put kerosene in it? No, he's not. Is he going to put diesel in it? No way. Is he going to put regular gas in it? No, very specialized. I believe that you and every one of your listeners is more important than a Bugatti. Mm. I, I just believe that. And so the fuel that we put in our body is very important. 
when we put junk in our bodies, we're putting just like we're putting junk in our car. And Harvard University says, when you put processed food in the body, you are to expect a negative outcome. That's mm -hmm. pretty significant. Mm -hmm. And so that fuel that you put in is going to determine, just like the fuel in that car, how well our bodies run. And that's because God has made us in such a unique and special way, hasn't he? Mm -hmm. It's so intricate. And it, and, it's, um, and it brings me back to that thought there, this one here, trust, trust in God, the T in the new start. Recently, uh, my dad's been in hospital and the lady across the ward from my dad uh, said, do you believe in God? And uh, we said, we do. And she said, you need to hang on to that and you need to pray, and you need to trust in God because it will get you through. And I believe that through any illness, when you have the trust in our God, in God, it's God who does the healing. It's Absolutely. God who created us. So he is the healer. And we need to trust in God. Walt, it has been an absolute pleasure talking to you today. You have given us and reminded us of eight simple ways that we can heal ourselves. You know, whether it be these big lifestyle diseases, cancer, uh, heart disease, uh, diabetes, and many other sicknesses as well. Implementing these eight basic principles is the best way to be healthy because that's the way that God created us. You know, in upcoming sessions, we are going to cover other health topics. So if you have any questions or thoughts or comments, send them into hubchatquestions at gmail.com. And remember, you know how social media works. So like the video, comment on it and share it with your friends and family. Walt, uh, to close our session today, I was wondering, would you finish with a prayer for us? I'd be glad to. Thank you. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for our, your love and your care for us. Lord, we thank you for being patient with us. And Lord, we, we thank you that you created a body that will repair. And Lord, we ask you, you give us that wisdom as we learn from programs such as this of how to take care of our bodies. And Lord, give us a desire to make those changes. Yes, appetite is very tough to change. But Lord, we know how valuable it is. But it's not just appetite. It's those other, other laws also that we must also do the exercise, the water, the fresh air, the, um, the sleep, the sunshine is so important. Having good temperance, making the right decision. And most importantly, give us that desire to trust you, but we know we got to do our part and Lord, give us that desire. And Lord, we ask that you will provide then healing and bless what we're doing. We ask this in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Thanks everyone. Mm -hmm.